Welcome to OpenGov TV. I have the pleasure of speaking with Nick Bora, who is the Vice President for Asia Pacific for Neo4j. We will be discussing in depth relationship matters, deriving value of data from connected data. Now, we all can agree that data has been clubbed the new oil, the new gold. But what does it really mean? Data is only valuable when it gives us insights. And yes, we have bolted on tools such as AI, ML, and are using it that we think to the best of its ability. I believe we have something that's new in the market, yet it is not so new, a graph data platform. Let's discuss that a little bit more. So let me ask you a question, Nick. Does every organization need to have graph data as part of their strategic play? Thanks, Mohit, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, to answer your question, let me let me rephrase and push the question back to you and say, does every organization have data that has connections within itself? Does all do all the data points that we naturally capture? Do all the data points that naturally exist are they connected or not? Right. So the question is not about the technology, but the question is more about the inherent value in data and graph data, as we call it, is really network and you know the science of networks and the science of relationships. And there's a huge market out there where people, your competitors, your you know industry associates, your ecosystem is leveraging the value of relationships. So as the last 24 months has seen, there's been a huge acceleration of digitization, of processes, of uh, supply chains, of people, of networks. And that has what that has made possible is that more and more information has come online, more and more data has gotten captured, more and more business outcomes and processes now depend upon data, and more and more optimization depends upon how much value we can create from data. So more than the need for graph as a technology, there is an urgent need for us to recognize the value of the connectivity in the data that exists as of today, and using those relationships and using those connections and how we approach that data. Now, graph data platform so happens to be the natural way, the most obvious way to look at connections because it's modeled as a graph, it's modeled as a network. Uh, but the underlying push for this technology is the value of relationships itself. Wow, that sounds pretty cool. But tell me one thing, does that mean all organizations need to restart the entire data collection strategy? how they collect it, how they store it, how they democratize it? Or is there an easy way of going about using this platform? Really, really good question. We, we actually get that a lot, right? Uh, and sometimes we say, when Facebook first started, did you learn how to make friends or did you already have friends, right? And we already had friends. It just so happened that we, did, we were not used looking at our friend circle as a network all the time. Although in our language, in our behavior, in our uh, you know, interactions, we did know that there was an interaction. We did know someone who knows someone. And we did get our next jobs, the promotion of the job. Uh, you know, we had this concept of networking for the longest while. Um, what Facebook and other social media platforms did was organize that at a billion scale um, in a digital fashion where human interactions went online. Right? So the data already existed. The behavior already existed. What we were able to do was now with that graph, um, in terms of the human graph online, we are now able to catch up with long lost friends. We are now able to catch up with our high school communities from our primary school communities. And that has added a further layer of social interaction. So it has improved our social lives. Um, and that applies to all aspects, right? Uh, you don't change your data. You just change your mindset to say, I do want to look at how the data is connected. I do want to look at how they relate to each other. And the good thing is the last many years, we have spent building data lakes and data warehouses and all the data you possibly need and more, you already have. All you have to do is turn on the tab and start looking at the relationships of how different data are connected across silos and processes and networks and transactions. And you can find new questions and new answers that can help you solve problems that you didn't solve before. Right, so, so 
what is wrong with the kind of stuff that we already have in our organizations? We all are getting some sort of insights from our existing data, and that data is vast. So what is this platform bringing that we are not seeing currently? There's nothing inherently wrong, right? There was, there was nothing wrong with riding on horses, and there was nothing wrong with this walking from a city to the next city. Uh, but we did invent cars. Um, and there was nothing wrong with cars, but then we got airplanes. Um, if we live in a static world, um, then I guess the current technology is great. It's fantastic. And, you know, we should all just use it. Um, the challenge is uh, we live in a very, very dynamic world where, you know, this small virus that none of us knew has just disrupted our lives. Uh, you know, one ship turning the wrong way in Suez Canal disrupted, I don't know how many Amazon orders globally. Um, we live in a hyper-connected world, and it's not until that connection link is broken somewhere that we realize how connected we are as a society. So there's nothing wrong with the current technologies. It's just when you look at the future and when you want to give yourself the best chance as an organization to compete, um, that's where you want to get better, and that's where you don't want to leave anything that you could have done to chance, right? So as you prepare to come out of this pandemic world in the post-pandemic world, um, as you prepare to look at COVID tracing, or if you prepare to look at supply chain optimizations or fraud detection, right? Um, to give you an example, fraud detection investments have taken place for 30, 40 years. As long as banks have gone digital, there have been these investments. At the same time, every year, the total amount of fraud has also increased. Now, how are these two possible? It's because fraudsters are getting smarter. It's, it's not just us who are getting smarter, right? The competition or the alternate forces are also getting smarter. So in order to keep up with what's coming our way, in order to keep up with the unknown um, that might come our way tomorrow, that's where we invest in these technologies. And in this new realization of how connected we are, if you're missing out on a connected data strategy where you're looking at data and how it connects and what are the relationships and what are the dependencies, right? If this person quits, what else might go away? If I lose this customer, is this an influencer customer? If I lose this one customer, can it hit my sales numbers for that territory? If I lose a particular store, can it hit or cannibalize other stores? So there's a lot of dependencies and connections within our ecosystem. And now it's important. The technology is there. Um, the ecosystem is there. The skills are there. The people are there. And it's the perfect time to start investing uh, into this journey. Spot on. And that makes a lot of sense. Now I'm a little bit concerned because I'm not sure if my team internally will have the skill set to embark on this journey. And you're right. If we're living in this highly interconnected world and we should be looking to push the envelope, because I think that's what you're bringing to the plate. How do we get that? How do we get that going? It's it's fairly fairly simple. If you if you look at the community of graph um, data uh, developers and graph data scientists, and you know not just Neo4j, there is a very wide community. Yes, we are number one in developers and in the market share, but there is a lot of other good options out there. And collectively, there's a huge talent pool which has embarked on a core ISO project. Neo4j is at the core of contributing to the ISO standards. And the languages that we have, um, Cypher is again open source, and it's extremely easy to pick for anyone who knows SQL or Python or any other declarative syntax. The skills are very easy to pick. There's a, it just within APAC alone, there are more than 300,000 developers who know the stuff. So when you embark on a project, on a journey as an organization, you have enough and more talent in the partner ecosystem as well as the developer, developer ecosystem who can embrace this. The good thing is, since companies like Neo4j are completely open source and they completely remain open source, you're never fully locked into a proprietary technology that has a risk of not being relevant in five years' time. Right? The, the onus on companies like Neo4j who are open source leaders is to stay compliant and in a, in a very simple way, we have to behave with the open source standards. If we don't, then we are no longer open source leaders and we lose the developer love. 
So that ensures that our customers always have a very open, connected, and interoperable platform. So the fact that we like the technology, you're saying it's quite easy for us to embed the technology and learn how to use it. The challenge becomes another expense on the books. How does one justify this in management? You got any case studies up your sleeve that we that, that people can take? Absolutely. Um, and I, I want to point out, it's not an expense you're making. It is, um, it's money that you're going to save somewhere else and it's money you're going to create. Um, and the reality these days is, it's not the fact that we have to make an expense. It's the choice of where we want to make that expense, right? We are investing our time. We are investing our effort. And more importantly, we are investing the future of the company based on some of the choices that we make, right? So if you look at fraud detection alone, fraud detection has gone offline as well as online. It's omni-channel. It's not just one fraudster somewhere who's you know dealing with one credit card. Um, and now with Neo4j graph data platform, which includes Neo4j graph data science as well as the core database, um, identifying fraud rings is that much more simpler we have uncovered millions of net new fraud. I'm not talking about millions of just fraud. It's net new fraud on top of what the banks were already doing. And this is true for the top two, top two private banks in Singapore. This is true for the, you know, one of the top banks in Australia and many other countries. In fact, 20 of the top 25 global banks are new for j customers. Mm -hmm. uh, so fraud detection, anti-money laundering are huge uh, areas of um, connectedness and finding new value. At the same time, there's a whole different universe of marketing to your customer, understanding your customer. Uh, more and more businesses have multiple customer touch points. Uh, it's no longer just a store or just an e-commerce website. You're there on social, you're there on mobile apps, you're there, you're, your customers everywhere. And getting an accurate customer 360 is harder than before. You have multiple people of the same household. Um, you know, what technically we call it identity resolution uh, for a customer 360 has just become harder and more complex, right? And to add to that complexity, you have customers in millions, and then you have data points that go in billions of records across transactions and events and sensors and all of that. So creating that is a huge problem. And then we have had customers, um, you know, one of the biggest airline in Southeast Asia, one of the most popular airlines in Southeast Asia has seen a 300% increase in the test group uh, after using Neo4j's graph data science. Um, and that was because we were able to get a much, much better understanding and a single customer view of the customer. Now to make that happen, we did not throw away any of the technologies they have. We added on top. So all the goodness that they had so far, the data lakes, the data warehouses, all your data science notebooks in R and Python, was then clubbed with the connectedness of a graph data platform. And that is what got you the increment um, in performance. So that's very good, Nick. What you're saying really is it's not then an expense. You're saying it's an investment within itself that will pay us off in the short run. Okay, that makes sense. Now tell me something. Can you name a couple of companies or organizations that have been using a Neo4j solution? Absolutely. Um, there are many, uh, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm going to miss a lot of companies. So I, I, anyone who wants to take a closer look, we have more than 800 enterprise customers. And by enterprise, we mean companies with an annual revenue of more than a billion dollars US. Um, we have Neo4j.com customers, uh, which will give you customers by use case, by industry, by location. Um, at the top of the mind, um, you know, and not by any means an exhaustive list, but as I mentioned earlier, AirAsia um, mm. is a very priced customer of ours. Um, we have quite a few customers, one of the largest banks in Australia, right? Without really naming, I'm naming that bank, but they are, they are a big supporter and a customer of ours, um, as well as somebody like a standard chartered and the other top um, bank in Singapore as well. Very recently, we partnered with DBS uh, and we were the only platform that was, uh, you know, that was really carrying the DBS hackathon on its shoulder, which is their flagship event. Um, now, you know, people can connect the two and two and, you know, make their own decision. But these are the kind of customers, right? The best in the class and the best in that vertical uh, are the kind of customers who are choosing uh, to go with Neo4j. At the same time, we have a large spectrum of startups, 
Um, we have Neo4j is everywhere. It's on-prem as well as cloud. And we have a large spectrum of uh, startup and digital native accounts um, that are using the Neo4j cloud experience um, across APAC as well. No, thank you for that. And you're right. You are on, on every cloud provider possible, right? So you, you could be an on-cloud option. You could be an on-prem option, depending on your data is sensitive and you need to hold some of that okay, in your own backyard. But last and not never the least, you mentioned some very big names over there. Any idea what got them going on this? What was their initial drive or their trigger? Because it's always a trigger a musician uses to jump from one to the other. Yeah, um, I, I think the credit goes to the organization. Um, the credit goes to their vision of where they want to head towards. Uh, and the credit also goes to the market pressures. Um, you know, these, these organizations are number one um, in their uh, ecosystem and they have to remain number one. And they do that by investing in technologies that will get them there. Um, so a lot of these organizations have decided to move, for example, a large part of the business to cloud to transform the way the customers experience um, things and to bring down the number of frauds. Uh, graph over the last many years, uh, including voiced by you know, the major analysts like Gartner, IDC, Forrester, have voiced that 50%, as recent as this uh, mid this year, Gartner said, 50% of all AI projects would include a graph, right? Mm. Now that, that, that goes because graph, adding graph to your existing AI strategy is a huge increment at almost a no brainer cost. Mm. The cost is minimal. You have spent millions of dollars of infra people and effort into AI. And just for a fraction of that cost, you can improve your confidence scores and improve the outcomes, right? You can get more ethical contextual AI. Why would you not do it? And I think these companies, what they're doing is they've established a path of leading and setting a precedence. And we are seeing a lot of other companies who are encouraged by the success that these leaders have seen um, and are also putting a lot of muscle behind. Um, more and more, Mohit, we, we, we don't see this question of how do we get started? It's more when do we get started and which, which is the first use case, right? Because Graph could connect any two ideas, right? You could, as a bank, you could go from data lineage to compliance, to risk, to cybersecurity, to whatnot. And the challenge we have is, you know, which is the first use case to get done? You know, bring it home, call it a win. And then based on that win, based on the learning, every organization has a different fabric. Um, and, you know, we work very closely with our customers to understand the fabric before we go organization-wide implementing graph. Um, so most of the days, the question is, what's the best use case? And that comes down from the board, right? That comes down from the leadership to say, we now want to invest in, let's say, cybersecurity. We want now to invest in data privacy. Um, mm -hmm. And that is where the conversation starts. No, absolutely. And you're spot on, Nick, on that, because you know, from our perspective, it's, it's definitely a journey that everybody has to get onto. Okay, it's not a question of, it's a question of when basically, right? Because you've got to jump onto it. And I agree with you, the, the people you mentioned are leaders. From an open gov perspective, we always believe that technology is an investment. Okay, you use it to get the cutting edge, the extra mile, because that's what separates you from everybody else. Wow, Nick, that was very insightful. I thank you for your time. More information, it is, okay, at neo4j.com. Everything else is available over there. Nick, thanks a ton. Thank you, Mike.